Hello friends, this is Sanjeev Kaushik and welcome to the episode 2 of the educational series Bonds, Banks and Bourses. In this episode, we'll carry on with our discussion on bonds and we'll dig a little deeper by learning the concepts related to yield, interest rates and inflation and especially how these three are related with each other. Let's get started with the yield part. Now those of you who have seen the episode 1 would already know we discussed about the present value of the bond and this is the formula that is used for deriving present value. Those of you who did not see the previous episode and may want to continue in this one, just a bit of a refresher in next one minute. So present value of bond is nothing but the price at which this bond is traded on a secondary market. So of course, if it's a bond, it should be paying certain coupons until it matures. And after maturity, it will pay back the face value to the owner of the bond. And all the future cash flows of this bond can be discounted at an interest rate by using this formula so that we can arrive at the present value of the bond. However, we spoke about the chicken or the egg situation. That is, if I already know the present value of the bond, can I now derive my yield here? That is, if present value of the bond is let's say x, then can I not plug this value of x over here and then derive my r? And that's why we said, by using the same formula, we can either derive yield or we can derive the present value of the bond. And that's more of a chicken or egg situation that we spoke about. Now let's continue. Yield is also called internal rate of return, which is nothing but just a fancy name to express the return one would generate when he would buy a bond at a certain price. That's it. Now, I want to dive a little deeper into the concept of yield. but I'll do that with the help of an example of a stock because this is a series for the stock traders or investors so that they become much more informed and knowledgeable in the world of bonds, banks and their relationship with stock market. Therefore, I thought taking an example of a stock would be much easier for us to understand the yields in a better way. So the stock that I've chosen is ExxonMobil. So you go to any website or any portal and you'll find that the portal would give you dividend yield of any particular stock. What it really means is if I buy ExxonMobil at its current price, the yield that I'm going to get is 5.81%, which is the return or in other words, the cash flows that I would receive in terms of dividends from owning the stock of ExxonMobil. So that's the percentage part. And the actual number is here, $3.48. This is the annualized payout. And this is the rate at which ExxonMobil has been increasing the dividend payout percentage to the shareholders. Or in other words, the value of the dividends that it is paying on a consistent basis. But we're not really bothered about all these nitty gritties related to the dividend. Now, what if ExxonMobil fell from say roughly $60 here to $35. What it means is now my dividend yield in this case would be much higher. So from 5%, my dividend yield would roughly go to 10%. Why? Because owning this stock at $35, I'm roughly getting almost $350. So my return is 10% on a yearly basis. And that's why my yield would be 10%, right? So yield is nothing but a point in time snapshot of internal rate of return. If you look at this snapshot over here, this is the dividend that ExxonMobil has been paying. And this is how the yield has been fluctuating over this period of time. And currently it is somewhere at 3.5%. So essentially, your yield is determined by the price at which you bought that stock. So that's the concept of yield. 
Can we take this concept of yield and relate this to the US Treasury yield? So as I said, it's all about the present value of the bond. So what this US one month Treasury yield of 0.05 over here signify is that if I were to lend $100 to the Fed, essentially the government of US, what I would get in return is 0.05%. Yes, this is in percentage. And if I lend the same $100 to the US for 30 years, this is my yield, 2%. So roughly 2% of this $100 is what I would receive every year for 30 years. That's what yield means. So if let's say this is the yield right now, and I want to lock this yield. I want this return until next 30 years. Although it's extremely small, but you can also argue that it's the US government. The chances of the government defaulting are minimal to none. So let's say you want to lock in this yield. What you want to do is you want to buy the bonds, preferably from the secondary markets that are going to expire in one month, three months, six months, and so on. By doing that, you have locked in your yield. This is definitely something that you're going to get. Unlike stocks, in which cases, let's say the company can go bankrupt, the company can choose not to pay out dividends, but in this case, you're locked in your yield. This is definitely something that you're going to get. And this process of locking in your yield by buying all these bonds of varying maturity is called bond laddering just a new concept for you to know. It has got absolutely no bearing on what we're going to cover next. So the question that you might ask over here is, there are bonds of varying maturity that trade every day in secondary markets, right? So if you're, let's say after a bond that is going to expire in seven years, it's hard to find exactly seven year maturity bond. Some could be seven year, two months, seven year, three months, six year, nine months, and so on, right? So the yield over here is really in the whole number of time period, but it changes on a fractional basis as well. And probably the other question that we should be asking at this stage is, let's say there's a 20 year bond, but that bond is going to expire in 2026, which means there are five years left for the bond to expire. This is my original maturity and this is my residual maturity. So what is the return that I'm going to get on this bond that has the original maturity of 20 years, but only five years left to run before it gets retired? The answer to this question is, the bond holder should be expecting an yield for five year and not for 20 year, because it's the residual maturity that matters and not the original maturity. It's very important concept for us to know. Many people do not go that deep and do not ask these kind of questions, but we should know what it means when we see the yield over a timeline like this. In fact, I can actually draw it in a graph, starting from say one year and even a few months before that, five years, 10 years, 20 years and so on, right? it'll look something like this because as you can see the yield is consistently increasing as we go into the higher time periods. This is how the graph would look like and it will be called an yield curve. So this is your yield curve and you might have heard about yield curve in a lot of conversations on say news channels and you might even have read about it. And we're going to go into the detail of yield curve and towards the end of this entire educational series, you would know each and everything that you must know on an yield curve as a stock trader or an investor. Now, an interesting data point that we are observing over here is it's showing the change in yield, right? There are three line graphs over here. This is the current one. This is from one month ago and this is from one year ago. As we can see over here, the yield is actually consistently on a rise, right? And this is true across all the maturities. 
what does it actually mean when we see a rise in yield like this? And what does it imply? Let's try to understand that concept. So we go back to the same formula in order to answer that question. Right? So the present value of the bond is inversely proportional to the yield. This R is nothing but the yield. Right? So if we see a rise in yield, and as you can see, I'm showcasing here the snapshot of 10 year bond yield, it's actually rising consistently. What does it mean when your yield goes up? Obviously, because of the inverse relationship, the present value of the bond will go down. Or in other words, can we say that all these people who are holding these bonds that are going to expire in next 10 year are actually selling them, right? Because that is what is pushing the prices down and making the yield go up. So this almost risk-free return of 1.513% is not acceptable to the bond owners. And that's why when they keep selling these bonds, the result of that is the rise in bond yield. And this is exactly what we have been seeing consistently. So next time when you hear that bond yield is rising, what it really means is that people are selling bonds in the market. And the opposite is also true. If people really want to lock in this yield of 1.513%, they think that this is the best yield available out there for a 10 year bond, they would want to buy. And if they'll start buying, the price of the bond will go up. And as a result, the yield would start going down. So you can say that in a layman term, even the yield is dictated by demand and supply. But there's a lot goes on behind the scene than just calling it a demand and supply dynamics. And we're going to talk about those as well in this particular episode. So now that we have determined that the price of the bond determines yield and yield in turn determines the price of the bond, then the question here is how important is the price itself? And the answer is not so much. You must have come across a lot of these news articles and even on the TV news channels. People often talk about the 10 year bond yield. What they really don't talk about is the prices, the coupon rate, the original maturity. Yes, of course, they talk about the residual maturity because this 10 year means all the bonds that are going to expire in next 10 years. So in other words, the coupon rates don't really matter much. It's the yield that does. It doesn't matter how much interest rate that bond is paying. What matters is what's the price at which I'm buying that bond. And that is determined by the yield. So if I know the yield, I would know everything else about that particular bond. All you have to tell me is when that particular bond is going to expire, and what's the yield on it? And I would know what's the return I'm going to get. Because that's fixed. There's absolutely no question about it. At least in the case of US Fed government debt, I know that I would always get paid. And therefore, all I care about is the yield and the residual maturity. And that's the reason why the most spoken about term related to bonds is the yield. So if the prices don't really matter much, the coupon rate doesn't matter much, the original maturity also doesn't matter much, then the real question that arises here is what is it that actually matters? And what actually matters is the future expectation of interest rates. That's because there is a reason why this particular yield is not acceptable to people. And the reason is the future expectation of interest rates. They are hoping that at some stage they will be able to get the interest rates that will be greater than 1.5% on a 10 year bond yield. And in order to lock in that higher yield, they'll start selling the bond and start pushing the yield higher. And this is how it works. They'll keep selling, right? and they'll keep pushing up the bond price. At some stage, let's say when the yield has come at 2%, the bond investors would be of the opinion, let's say that, okay, fine, this is a good yield. I want to lock that in. That's when the buying will start coming in, right? Buy, 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 
And what happens if a lot of demand for the same bond comes back? The yield will start falling back again, right? Because of the inverse relationship between the bond price and the yield. So that's how the demand supply fluctuates the bond prices and the yield. But right now, the markets are very, very certain that 1.5% is not acceptable to them. And that's why they're selling the bonds, pushing the yields higher. Now, the question that you might ask at this stage is, why interest rates matter so much? Because of interest rate risk, right? And what do I mean by that? Let's say I am a bond investor, right? And I own bonds worth, say, $100 million. And I am earning an yield of 2% on it. And the markets all of a sudden start expecting that this yield of 2% is not acceptable and what we want is 2.5%. I would see that a lot of people who are holding the same bond would start selling, right? The selling would come. So the mark to market value of my $100 million bond will start coming down. So I also want to be the first one who offloads this entire holding so that in future, when the rates go up to 2.5%, I want to lock that in. Right, So that's my interest rate risk. I want to lock in the best price and best interest rate available out there at the minimal risk that I can take. If the US government is going to pay out higher interest rates to me in future, why would I want to settle with less? So the real reason is people want to avoid carrying interest rate risk. Because if you look at it, this is the only risk that you carry when you're lending to the US government. The US government is never going to default. I can't say about next 10 to 30 years, but in the next zero to 10 years, there's absolutely no chance for the US government to default. So the only risk that I should be mitigating at this stage is my interest rate risk. I want to lock in the best rate. So if the future expectations of interest rates determine the yield as well as the prices of the bond, then what are the factors that in turn impact our future expectations of interest rates? And there are mainly three factors that impact the expectations on interest rate. And those are, of course, inflation expectations. If the inflation is going to rise, right, everything is going to get costly. So the interest that I'm going to earn on my bond holding should also go up. Maturity premium and default premium. Bear with me and we're going to cover all these three in this episode. So let's start with inflation. And as you probably are already aware, inflation is nothing but the decline of purchasing power of any given currency over a period of time. In this case, I've taken a dollar. So one cup of coffee in 1970, you could buy it for 25 cents. Nowadays, you have to pay $1.60. So let's see how the inflation has changed in US over a very, very long period of time. Do you know that the Federal Bank was actually created in 1913? A little trivia for you. So back in 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created, you could buy 30 Hershey's chocolate bars in $1. And as you can see, this is how the dollar has declined in value. And nowadays, with $1, you can buy a McD coffee. And as you can see, the value of dollar has been declining consistently. Now, even on inflation, there are realized inflations. That is the actual or the current inflation that we are already recording in terms of price increases. And then there's expected inflation. How do you derive your realized inflation? It's very simple. Let's take this example over here. In 2019, the coffee price was $1.59. In 2000, the coffee price was $1. So the increase in price is 0.59 or 59%. So we can say that inflation in coffee has increased by 59% in 19 years from year 2000 to 2019. That's your realized inflation. So this is not complicated. And here is the formula. But the expected inflation is slightly different. And it's tricky as well for us to derive expected inflation. 
But before we get to the calculation of expected inflation, why is it that the expected inflation matters so much? Because it's the inflation that's going to determine our real returns. So here I bring in the concept of real returns and nominal returns. If a bond is, let's say, paying me 4% in coupon, but the inflation is actually 1%, then in that case, my real return would be 4 minus 1, that is 3%, right? So as you can see, my real returns are determined on the basis of my inflation. If we are typically talking about bond, we already know what's our nominal return. This is nothing but our yield or internal rate of return. But it's the inflation that is a dominant factor that determines the interest rates. So if I reverse this example and let's say my inflation in turn is instead of 1%, it is 5%, then going by the same example here, my real return is going to be minus 1%, right? I am losing money by holding that particular bond and that's why as and when I anticipate that the inflation is going to go up I do want higher returns that is I do want the bond that I'm holding to pay me higher coupon rate the existing bonds do not cut it anymore so what I would do is I would sell those bonds come back in cash and invest in those bonds that are paying me higher interest rates to make sure that I am getting my real rate of return which is positive and acceptable to me. And obviously, determining the expected inflation is not an easy task. Many economists and even central banks fail in accurately determining what the inflation is going to be in future. In fact, if you're someone who can do that, you can make a lot of money in a very short span of time. If you can assess what the expected inflation would be, you can also assess with a very high accuracy, the interest rates that are going to be in future. So accordingly, either you'll buy the bonds or sell the bonds. Essentially, you can play the market. And that's the whole game, right? Predicting and predicting right. Now, how do you actually predict the expected inflation? And this is the formula. Now, you may argue that, okay, we have the formula. And based on this formula, we can essentially derive what the prices are going to be in future. And by knowing those, we would know the expected inflation, but it's not that simple. The only thing that you would know for sure is the money supply in the economy. Any central bank always knows how much of its currency is in existence at any given point in time. So this is a known. We already know that. What about the velocity? Velocity is the rate at which the money circulates in the economy right? But it's not really that simple because nobody can estimate the velocity with high accuracy or high certainty. Same is the case with real output in the economy. You can never tell how much of goods and services are actually going to be produced. You can always make an informed prediction based on the historic data and based on the demand, etc. But the real output is never known and the inflation rises at a higher pace if the real output in the economy fails to meet the increase in money supply or the increase in velocity. If they both increase, but they both increase at same pace, then your prices would not change. But that's not how things work. So the prices do fluctuate. And this is the formula. And you must have heard the term too much money chasing too few goods and services, right? And that's exactly the case. When you've got too much money in the economy, that's how the inflation creeps in. And this is the formula using which you can estimate the future inflation. Now, in the real world, why is it that the world is so concerned about inflation in 2021? In fact, the fear of inflation has been around for almost 18 months now. Ever since Fed started the QE and the governments across the globe started giving direct help to their citizens by paying them cash or by giving them any kind of subsidies, 
essentially increasing the supply of money in the economy, the fears of inflation have been growing since then. And the reason behind that fear is this blip that you can see over here. This graph is showing us the supply of M2 money. Now there's a monetary theory, there are M1 money, M2 money and M3 money, but that is really beyond the scope for us. Here, M2 money, think of it as all the dollars that are in circulation in the entire world, not just in US, in the entire world. And since the pandemic started back in 2020, you can see that the increase in money supply is actually quite steep. In fact, it is so steep that you've never seen such rise in past 50 years or so. And if you want to know how steep this rise is, here is a fun fact for you. 25% of all the US dollars currently in circulation, all the US dollars anywhere in the world, 25% of it was created in just last 18 months only. No wonder the world is staring in the face of rising inflation. Unless, of course, the real output in the economy also increases. You cannot hope for the velocity of money circulation to go down in order to curb the inflation. Why? Because velocity of the money also determines the GDP of your economy. The more people would spend, the higher the GDP or the growth of your economy would be. So you do not really want people to be holding on to cash because that is going to be counterproductive for the economy. So the only way by which you can actually bring down the prices at this stage, especially when the M has increased by 25%. And that's a big jump, right? So the real output in the economy should really grow. If that doesn't happen or the real output in the economy is not able to keep pace with the rise in money supply as well as velocity, then we will see the rise in inflation. But there are really lots of bits and pieces that are related to how the inflation is going to go up. There are some supply chain issues. There are some cost push. There are some demand pull. So even inflation can be of certain types. So this is one of the reasons why the markets are really expecting for the liquidity to be sucked off the markets as soon as Fed can so that some of these fears of inflation can be eased. Whether the inflation would go up or not, I'm not predicting anything at this stage. There are a lot of aspects related to inflation that we are going to cover in the next episode. Inflation is so interesting and there's so much to learn in this particular topic that I decided not to cover everything in this episode, but in next episode. So when we will cover other factors that actually impact inflation, we would know that it's not as simple as saying that because 25% of all the USD in existence have only been created in the last one, one and a half year. That's why inflation must go up. That may not be the case. So that's all that I wanted to cover about inflation expectations. And before we go on and talk about maturity premium, there's actually a Fisher equation as well that helps us determine the expected inflation rate. If you know the nominal rates, that of course are the ones that you're receiving, and you know the real rates that are actually going to be in future, which is a little more tricky, you can actually also derive your expected inflation rate. So there are more than one ways of determining the expected inflation rate. Now let's move on to the maturity premium. So maturity premium refers to the difference in interest rates between short term and longer term bonds. And this difference is even more clearly visible when we look at the yield curve. Let's say this yield curve, instead of going like this, if you would have seen an yield curve like this, you would know that the maturity premium for this particular bond for which this yield stands is actually very steep. In other words, people are really scared of lending to this particular borrower and that's why they want to charge higher interest rates for longer maturity. Because in a way, they are scared that they may not get their money back. There's a bit of a default risk. But we'll talk about default risk in the next section. So this is the maturity premium. And if you see the rise in interest rate over here, it tells us that even US government has to pay 
higher interest rates as maturity premium. Because everybody knows that US government may not default in next, say, three years or so. That's why they're happy with, say, 0.52% return over next three years. But in order to lend to the US government for next 30 years, even the lenders want a maturity premium because anything can happen. So the maturity premium is already built in into the yields. And interestingly, even the inflation expectations sometime impact the maturity premium. If people are not expecting any change in inflation, this is how the maturity premium would look like. It doesn't matter if you're borrowing for, let's say, one year or 30 year. If there is going to be absolutely no inflation, I'm happy to receive whatever return that you're going to pay me. All else being equal, by the way, right? If I think that this particular borrower can default, then that would be a different scenario. So it is not really as simple as saying that just because there are no inflation expected in future that I would not charge any premium. This is just to give you an example that inflation expectations also determine the maturity premium. If the expectation is that the inflation would rise, then it would also add on to the maturity premium. And if the inflation is going to decline, this is the expectation, then you would see the maturity premium also coming down. At the end of the day, as we've already spoken about, all these factors that we're going to study in this episode, they play a part in the demand supply dynamics, right? If I'm expecting the inflation to go up, I'll sell the bonds, I'll push the yields up. If someone wants to borrow from me for a longer duration, I want to charge them extra interest rate, right? And so on. And lastly, let's now focus on the default premium. So again, on top of the maturity premium, People expect that even USA can default. And that's why 30 year yield is at this level. But this is USA. If you were to lend to your neighbor, of course, you wouldn't really want to lend at such a low interest rate because your neighbor can default, right? Or maybe neighbor is too personal an example. Let's try to compare the US government's yield with, let's say, a company a company that is as reliable as Apple. Last year, when yields were really low, Apple tried to take the advantage of it by issuing bonds worth $2 billion expiring in three years, $2.25 expiring in five years. This is a snapshot from Benzinga and they have done a mistake over here. They should really do a better job in editing. And $1.75 billion for 10 years and so on. And the interest that it is paying is, let's pick one, for three years, the interest it's going to pay is 0.75%. What's the interest that US government is paying for three years? Only 0.5%, right? So Apple is paying a default premium of 0.25%, which is still better, right? 0.75% not bad. And that's the reason why Apple sold so many bonds to raise the capital from the market. And this is a company, mind you, that has roughly about 180 to 200 billion dollars in cash on its books. And they still wanted to raise more money because they know that even by borrowing at these prices, they can generate higher returns for their shareholders. And that's why they sold the bonds. Perhaps people already know how reliable this company is or what are the chances for Apple to default. But for any other borrower, how do you determine the default premium? And in order to answer this question, in comes the rating agencies. You must have heard of the names S&Ps, Moody's and Fitch and so on. And what they do is they give credit ratings to anyone who wants to get a credit rating. If you have the money, you can go to any of these companies and they can give you your own credit rating as well. But perhaps you don't really have to do that because there are different kinds of ratings that are even assigned to individuals and based on those, the banks lend to the individuals. But if you have a company, by all means, you can go to these rating agencies and they'll give you the rating for your particular company. And of course, there are no free lunches. You'll have to pay for that. This is one of the major source of revenue for these companies. So of course, as you can see over here, the credit rating rates keep on going down as we go from the AAAs to the CCs and so on. And this table actually compares the ratings 
between each other of these agencies. So if Apple let's say has A rating, then accordingly the default premium on A rated Apple would be much lower than a company let's say that has a double B rating. Almost everything that issues debt has a rating. Some companies may not be able to afford to get these ratings, so they would remain unrated. But it is also a matter of prestige as well as another way of projecting your size in front of the lenders. And that's why some of the companies go to these agencies to get their ratings. Otherwise, there are some second and third tier rating agencies as well that can give you these kind of ratings, right? So it's not like there are only three of these. There are many, many rating agencies. Every country has its own rating agencies as well, which are nothing but the private companies. Now, we spoke about Apple. Even the debt or the bonds that Apple is issuing, there can be a rating that would be specific to Apple. And then there would be rating assigned to the bonds that Apple has issued. One of the bond can have A rating, the other bond can have say BB negative rating and so on. So what it means is even though it's the same company that's issuing the bond, if Apple were to default tomorrow and I'm holding A bond which is senior to double B negative bond and that's actually the terminology that is used when it comes to uh, ratings and so on. A bond is senior to double B negative bond. Which means if Apple were to default, A would have first claim on the assets of Apple to recover its money. And once A has recovered all the money, then only the double B negative would get the chance to recover anything from Apple if anything is left at all. Why would someone want to invest in double B negative then? Why not go with A? That's because if Apple is issuing bonds double B negative, then it will have to pay, of course, a higher default premium. So an A bond might be carrying an interest rate of say 1% whereas the double B negative bond could be issued at an interest of let's say 4%. So there's a trade off here. What do you want to go with? You want to go with a subordinate bond with claims on the company's assets only after some of the senior debts or you want to go with the senior debt but you'll have to settle down with lesser interest rate. So that's the concept of senior and subordinated debt or bonds. Now this was a comparison of Apple with a government. How about we do a bit more of an Apple to Apple comparison and in order to do that I have chosen to compare the US with India. So this is the ratings chart here and let's pick S&P's rating for US. So this is for US and this is for India. The US has been rated as AA plus by Standard & Poor's. AA plus is somewhere here at number two. Whereas the same agency has rated India as triple B negative. That is this one. So you can see the difference. This difference would also appear in the interest rates that these two countries are paying to their lenders. While US on a 10 year bond is paying 1.5% India on the 10 year bond is paying 6.2% and this difference between the two is determined by default premium as well as inflation expectations because there's no maturity premium both are for 10 years right if you were to compare a country that has higher rating than triple B negative but lower rating than double A plus then you would see that that country is paying lower interest rates than India and higher interest rates than US. So this is about credit rating and default premiums. Now before I let you go, something else that might have come to your mind is if there are so many bonds that are issued, why is it that the press always only talks about 10 year yield? In fact, in most of the cases they do. Maybe not always, but in most of the cases, right? They look at 10 year yield to determine how the bond markets are behaving and the reason for that is the longer term bonds are much more sensitive to interest rate changes than the shorter term bonds. Just to give you an example, if the interest rates change from 8% to 10%, which is an increase of 2%, that is 25% in percentage terms, the 5 year bond would decline in value by 7.61%, but a 50 year bond would decline almost 20%. And that's why 
tenure, you can think of them as kind of a sweet spot. They do react to the expectations of changes in interest rates. They neither react too much nor react too less. Right? So tenure is more of a sweet spot. That's why tenure is considered a benchmark. And the other reason is usually when banks lend, they lend with a horizon of 10 years or so, especially the mortgage lending. Of course, you take the loans that are going to expire in 20 years, 25 years, and even 30, 35 years, but banks only take 10 years worth of a horizon in mind. You might even end up refinancing as well, right? So banks do not expect you to stick around longer than 10 years anyway. So they look at your credibility as well as their own profitability over next 10 years worth of a horizon. And that is another reason why the 10 year yield is what markets look at. And we'll talk about the banks part as well in much more detail. Okay, one last point before we wrap up. What about the coupon rate? That is, if the maturity plays a role in determining how sensitive they are to the changes in interest rates, do coupon rates also play a role? Because at the end of the day, there are only three attributes that are related to a bond. It's price, it's coupon rate, and lastly, it's maturity. So we already have determined how the maturity is sensitive to interest rates. Let's take an example to understand this. Let's say I am receiving coupon of 18% on a bond and we stick to the same example of 8% to 10% increase. It doesn't really matter, right? If the interest rates are going to increase from 8 to 10% because I'm still receiving 18%. So it wouldn't really matter much to me. And that's exactly how the markets behave as well when it comes to interest rate sensitivity for higher coupon rate bonds. If the coupon rates are much, much higher than the existing interest rates or the future expectations of interest rates, then it wouldn't really be too sensitive to the changes in interest rates. But if the interest rates are lower, let's say the interest rates were say 9%, then of course the change over here would definitely have impact on this particular bond. So if you have survived this long, I thank you a lot for being with me and giving me your precious time. So we covered bond valuation in part one and we covered other key concepts related to bonds in second part. In the next episode, we're going to cover inflation and it's going to be a very, very interesting episode as well. Thank you and I'll see you soon.